Hey, good morning. Hey, join me in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, got a question for you. How's your family? Good, good, good. You know, we do that a lot, you know, just kind of in casual conversations. Sometimes we actually care, sometimes we don't. We just don't like the awkwardness, <laughs> you know what I mean? But how's your family? I mean, that's kind of a question. We always answer it, oh, everybody's good. I mean, somebody could be at home with a bunion that big, but we're going to say good. <laughs> you know, it's just what we do in casual conversation. How's your family? I'll give you one better. Who's your family? Who's your family? Now, that one gets us a little deeper. Okay, you can tell a lot about a family by the stick people they put on their car. You can. I mean, you can. I like, I like the ones that have them all headless, and the dude at the end has a sword because this vehicle is a Highlander. You ever see those? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But anyways, we, we, we get into that deeper question. Well, who is your family? That could be, well, my wife, my son, my daughter, you know, or it could go a little deeper than that. We're a fun family who loves boating and playing board games on the boat. We can go into all these details, right, on who we are. I'll go you one better. Why is your family? Ooh, now that one gets a little trickier. Why is your family? What are we doing together as a family? But have you ever stopped to think about all this, who we are and what we do, and even how we are? There's got to be something more to the family, right? Have you ever felt that way? There's got to be something more to why God has put me and this, this lady together. There's got to be more to why God brought these kids into my life. There's got to be more to why, that why component. Because you guys understand family, the husband and wife, survived the fall of man. You realize that, right? God instituted marriage before Adam and Eve sinned. Marriage survived the fall, but now it looks like marriage is falling apart. And there is there's no denying we've got families in trouble. In fact, I'll read you this quote from an article from The Atlantic that says, the big components of our lives, getting married, living together, having sex, having kids, it used to be that all these components all came packaged together, and now they've all come apart. People can pick and choose whatever components they want. The title of that article is, if the nuclear family has failed, what comes next? You know, the nuclear family being man marries girl and they have kids. If that has failed, what comes next? My answer, how about we try the Christian family now? <laughs> Let's move to the Christian family because the, the, we forget that your family actually has a purpose. God designed this thing not just off a whim. I mean, he didn't say, hey, yo, it'd be really funny. Let's put a man and a woman together and tell them they got to live in harmony. <laughs> You know, there was more to it than that. God has a reason for your, your family. Let's break that family up just a second. The husband and wife, the beginning of the family. God's got a purpose for your marriage, and here it is. The great purpose of marriage is that we as husband and wife reflect the image and the love of God through our human relationship, right? How do we do that? By mutual submission to God-given roles so that the world understands that Jesus came. How does that work? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But that's the purpose of your marriage. It's not just to be happy. It's not just to, to have somebody to help you pay the bills, right? What it's about is that we begin to, as a couple, reflect the love and the image of God to the world around us by submitting to those mutual uh, God-given roles. Wow. But it goes even deeper. Because you guys know how it goes. First comes love. Second comes marriage. Third comes Billy with sinful and rebellious creatures to raise in the nurture and admonition of the Lord in a baby carriage. <laughs> Children. Children are that other part of the family. You know, they're, they're in addition to the family. In fact, in for, uh, Psalm 127, 127, it tells us that children are a heritage from the Lord. And it said, blessed is the guy who's got a quiver full of them little arrows. Why? Because your kids are to further that mission. They join in the process. They are also part of that glory to God and reflection of his image by coming alongside the, the man and the wife, the, the parents, and showering the love of Jesus on the world again. But somewhere along the way, in our big American dreams, and our big everything else, and our own personal pursuits, we have lost the purpose of why God assembled a family. You see, as a family... We talked last week about the church and community. Remember that? We talked about how the church is a community, a Christ-centered relationship, right? That's what we are. 
And somehow, some way, we've gotten the idea that you separate family out of that and that it is something distinct. I think it comes from the false notion that church is just what we're doing here right now. The church is not what we do here on a Sunday morning. The church is who we are as the redeemed of Christ. And your family feeds directly into that. So I guess the big question of today is this. Does your purpose in your family and God's purpose for your family line up? Did you know it was supposed to? Yeah, because God can do amazing things in and through your family. God can impact the world through your family. God can change a church through your family. God can reach individuals. God can reach people. God can save other marriages by yours. God can help other kids by you reaching out. I mean, this is what God intends to do. Are we in this? If you want God's power in your marriage, this is why this is so important. You want to see God's power in your marriage, then you make your marriage on God's purpose. If you want to see God at work in your kids, you bring them in the mission. And you want to see God at work and his power displayed in your family, then you've got to have the family on mission. So this morning, as we're, you know, we're going through this series right now called Life on Purpose. And as we're dealing with life on purpose, we need to talk about family on purpose. Because that's who we are. We're all interconnected as the big family here in the church, as the family units that we have. That's what we got to look at. So we want to talk today about those family units, your family Who's your family? Yeah, how's your family? Why is your family? Let's talk about how that works a little bit today. We're going to see today three marks of a family on purpose. Three marks of a family on purpose. But as we look at this, I want you to understand these are things to start like living toward. Try to embrace them. Because as we do, you're going to start to understand not just God's purpose for marriage in general, but God's purpose for yours. Not just God's purpose for family in general, but God's purpose for yours. And uh, I, I want to be sensitive here. I get some of you, man, your kids are already grown. they out of the house. Some of you haven't even met Mr. or Mrs. Wright yet. Yeah? Some of you are in that position. Some of you are, are well, let's just, you know, some are, some are not living with a family right now. Don't tune this out. Because now, if nothing else, you're going to know how to pray for families. If nothing else. So join us in, in looking at that these marks of a family on purpose. We're going to look through Ephesians chapter 5 and see it. And just kind of a warning, we're going to start at the bottom and then work our way back through. Okay, Ephesians 5. But uh, uh, in Ephesians 5, we're going to see mark number one, a family on purpose is gospel-centered. A family on purpose is gospel-centered. What does that mean? Look in Ephesians 5 verse 32. Actually, back up, we'll get 31. 31. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He's quoting from Genesis. Okay, you guys got that. He's quoting there. We're going to leave husband and uh, father and mother. We're going to cleave to a wife, become one flesh. He says in verse 32, the mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Hold up here. God's design for the family is that it ultimately reflect Jesus Christ. That's the design, his gospel. That forms everything else that we're going to talk about. Your family, especially beginning in your marriage, is a reflection of the gospel. It's a proclamation of the gospel. The world ought to look at your family and see, wait a minute, there's something different about them. What is it? And then when they begin to understand Jesus, your family makes sense. Or when they begin to understand your family, then what we say about our Christian faith begins to make sense. How is that? In a gospel-centered family, the atoning work of Jesus on the cross becomes the foundational concept of everything else we do. The foundational concept. It answers the question, why we do what we do. It answers the question how we do what we do. Why? Because everything we're doing is about reflecting Jesus, not us. Reflecting what we learn about him from the cross. This means that our definitions in our family are gospel-centered. How do we as a family, how do you as a family define love? Love is defined by God, not us, by the way. And God defines love as greater love has no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's love. You know, how do we define love in our families? How do we find obedience, uh, define obedience in our families? How do we define sacrifice or service? You know, service is, well, it's my turn to do the dishes. You know, and you throw out the Tupperware instead of wash it and hope nobody notices. That's how we wind up with a thousand lids and three bowls. (laughs) But you get what I'm saying? It's not just I'm doing a chore. 
Because this uh, definition begins to define our motives as well. The motive is not simply love. The motive is Christ's reflection. The motive is to define the gospel by our actions. We, everything, because Christ died for us. I view my washing of the dishes as a mode to show my family what Jesus came to do for us. Not die on a cross, okay? I'm not doing that by washing the dishes, but I'm showing a servant attitude. Why? Because I want my family to understand that Christ was a servant in that attitude when he died on the cross. Why do I love them so much? The motive becomes I love them because I want them to understand how God loves them. And it reflects in everything that I do for them. That's what I'm talking about here. Are we centered in our everything around that gospel that I want to demonstrate Jesus? I want to define my life by Jesus because it will ultimately not only define our motives but also our actions. We love each other. We submit to each other. We pray for each other. We sacrifice for each other. Why? Because Jesus did for us all those things. And suddenly, as we're doing these things as family, we want that to be the focus. We love all these things as unto the Lord. With that core conviction in us that we talked about a few weeks ago, that God will honor work done in his name. Remember when we talked about that? What we commit to the Lord in his purpose according to his gospel, he will honor it. Husband, love your wife because Jesus loves you and you want her to feel Jesus' love, not yours. Wife, love your kids and your husband. Why? It's because you want them to experience Christ's love through it. And as you commit to that, you say, man, we're going to center what we do, what we think, what we believe around what Jesus has done, and the motive becomes, I want to show what Jesus has done. My actions reveal what Jesus has done. You watch what God does in your family. That becomes the motive. That becomes the fundamental framework for embracing everything else as we center the family on that gospel. Watch what God will do, because a family on purpose is first gospel-centered. Secondly, A family on purpose embraces their roles, embraces their roles. In fact, I would go as far as to say, unless you're seeing your purpose as gospel-centered, you will not embrace these roles. What are the roles? Man, (laughs) gender roles are pretty big in our society right now. Yeah, they are. Everybody's like, well, what about equality? And what about, you know what? We have a really weird definition of what makes people equal. We are defining that our roles and our positions and our income and the power we do or do not have at work, it means equality. That is not the Bible's position. The Bible takes this position. Raise your hand in this room. I'm going to take a gamble. Okay, I would bet money. Everybody's going to raise their hand, but I don't bet money. But you know what I'm saying. I would just do it, okay, because I'm pretty sure about this one. Raise your hand if you are human. All right, good. Good. Some of you may look like you're in mid werewolf transformation, but is it? I trimmed. <laughs> but we're human. That makes you intrinsically valuable to our Christ and should make you intrinsically valuable to one another, equally so because of your humanity. However, we do have different roles to play. And when those roles come into play, we get to embrace that gospel that God has called us to live. What are these roles? <laughs> well, let's start, like we said, with the, uh, the husband and wife. That's the foundation of the family. Let's just kind of start there. Uh, Clint Eastwood, the great theologian, <laughs> said this. He said, they say marriages are made in heaven, but so are thunder and lightning. <laughs> you know, then he's not really wrong. Go back to verse 22 here. Still in Ephesians 5, verse 22. It says, and we're going to start with the wives because that's where Paul starts with here, okay? And you go in Colossians, he starts with a husband. Peter in 1 Peter 3 talks about this as well, just, just, but we're here. He says in verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Hmm. That one gets attention. (laughs) You know, I'm probably, you know what, let's just not comment. Let's move on. No, I'm going to (laughs) comment. Because here's the impression we get. We look at that, and we hear in our society, and it is pushed on us in our society, what do you mean? You're not inferior? Of course you're not inferior. That is not the point. Remember Philippians chapter 2, where the Bible says that Jesus, though in the form of God, he was God himself, 
But he didn't count that as a thing to be held, but he released. Why? To become a servant. Was Jesus any less because of that? No. Was he less God because of that? No. What makes you think by submitting to the role of a, uh, in submission, that you're less of a human for that? In fact, what the command is here, a wife, is that is how you model Jesus in the home. You're modeling Jesus. You see why we've got to get back to the gospel-centeredness. We've got to understand that. The whole call here to submit is based upon how Christ submits to God and how the church submits to Christ. You're demonstrating that. That is the why behind all of this. What is submission about? Submission is not, woman, make me a sandwich. (laughs) That is not what we're talking about here. Submission in the biblical context there is seeking the good, accomplishing the will of the head, and being part of that mission. That's what we're talking about here. That's what the Bible is presenting. As the church submits and say, yes, Jesus, your life is mine. Your mission is mine. Your work is mine. So the wife will do, treat her husband and thus show the gospel. Do you understand that? That's what he's talking. We can't lose that context here. So how do we do that? I mean, how do you ladies do that, right? <laughs> Again, this has nothing to do with any quality. This is actually showing how great you are. Because this is what Jesus, after having done this, the Bible says he submitted himself even to death, but then rose. And at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus is God, or Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? How do we do that, man? You need to empower your husband. That is not stroke his delicate ego, okay? That is not lie to him about how great his barbecue is. What we're talking about here is actually empowering him to lead the home. I promise you ladies this, your criticism hurts us more than any other humans. Your downplay of our lives and our quest and our mission will destroy us more than anybody else's. You see, when the wife comes alongside and sees herself as that help that is meat for her husband, wow, and she empowers that. She says, okay, this is what we need to do. How do we make this happen? How do we get on mission? How can I support? How can I help? That's what we're doing here. So you empower him in this. Yo, be his cheerleader. Empower him to lead the home. Support him as he does. Help him accomplish that. Help him lead. Walk beside him. Be his strength when he cannot be. And husband, here's the catch. Your wife... Dude, she knows you. She washes your underwear. She knows you are not perfect. Why do you pretend to be? You want to make your lady happy, you tell her how much you need her. You tell her what a benefit she is to you and how you can follow Jesus better because of her and how you feel stronger because of her. And ladies, praise your husband. You know, praise him at the gates in Psalm 31, or, uh, Proverbs 31, rather. Praise him in the gates, you know. Don't speak negatively of him to others. At least in public, be on the same team. At home, you can be like, dude, what are you thinking, man? Let's get on page here. But at least in public, be on his team and speak well. Because such is the power of that gospel presentation you bring. Such is the power of that, that according to 1 Peter chapter 3, the, the, the wife who embraces this can win her unbelieving husband to Jesus. That's the power of this. Let's embrace it, right? Husbands, you're good. We'll move on. <laughs> now, let's, let's spend a minute here. Let's spend a minute here. Look at verse 25. We're still on these roles. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, in the same way husbands should love their own wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. And because we're members of his body... Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother, holds fast to his wife, two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love your, his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Uh, guys, 
if the wife shows the gospel through her submission as Christ submitted to the Father, sought his will and purpose, and the church submits to Christ, then we show the gospel by sacrificial living for our wives. Sacrifice. That means put down a video game controller sometimes. <laughs> that means sometimes you gotta give up some pretty powerful things. The lady bears the image in submission, we bear the image in sacrifice. Our lives are not our own. We don't work for the benefit of us anymore. We work for the glory of them. That's the purpose. We work to draw out in them everything. I mean, this is a true story. I'm not going to use names, but it's, it's a true story of a young man who desired more than anything else uh, a position somewhere that was not just a safe position, but it's what he dreamed of his whole life. He trained for his whole life. Got a black belt so he could do it better, right? Then he got, met a little girl and he got married. And she just couldn't handle the pressure, constantly worrying about his dream. Constantly, you know, just, it became a point of conflict in the marriage, a point of strife, where they just could not have peace because of his pursuit of his dream. And the young man, after prayerful consideration, decided his wife was more important than his dream. And he walked away to embrace his wife. Harmony in the home ensues. Now I'm not telling you guys that you gotta drop everything on the planet, but you've gotta prioritize that lady. And yes, there are times when you're gonna have to make those sacrifices. Yes, there are times when you're gonna rather do something or be somewhere else. There are times when the movie is killing you, literally. But we make those sacrifices because of love. Why? Because I promise you this, there have been times that I personally have been a pain in the side of Jesus, <laughs> but he loved me anyway. There are times that I have not been worthy of that, but he gave his life and demonstrated his love for me and that when I was yet unworthy, when I was a sinner, Christ died for me, making that sacrifice so that he could redeem me to himself. Husbands, sacrifice your pride. Sacrifice your whatever else it may be for the building up of your wife to treasure her. And in doing that, man, could you imagine that? Bunch of guys getting together and they're doing all this talk or whatever, and you're like, no, nah, I can't think that way, man, I'm married. No, I can't look at that, I'm married. No, I can't, man, the ridicule that'll come your way, but the glory that God will pour in your family for it. Make those sacrifices. Hey, kids, guess what? You're in here today, it's family Sunday. You're not exempt from any of this. I wanna to talk to the kids for just a second here. Look, in, in chapter six, we're gonna move on. You, the children have a role to play too. Chapter six, children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Mm. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment of a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Stop there for a second. Hey kids, guess what? You've got to obey your parents. And the word for obedience there, I'll give you a couple of things here that's going to be really neat and really beneficial for many of you. The word for obedience there is different from submission. Submit and blindly obey are two very different things. Okay? But obedience, that obey, is what kids are commanded to do. Imagine, imagine kids, and uh, I'll tell you what, let me just start here. The word for child there in the Greek is not 18 and under. It is for any human being still living in their parents' home. Wow, but I'm 18, hey, congrats. <laughs> that ain't what the Bible's teaching about children. <laughs> oh. huh. So let's talk about that obedience. Imagine it's the fourth quarter, because I think we're all football-minded right now. I see some red out there. A little bit of orange, but I'm going to overlook that. And it's the fourth quarter. 13 seconds left in the game. You, you're six down, 20 yards from the end zone, and it's fourth down. And as that huddle comes in, you're listening intently to the instruction because you don't want to miss it. You're hearing the instruction, understanding your route, knowing what you need to do. Nothing is distracting. You're here and you have every intent of doing what you got to do for the team. That's the word obey in this passage. That's what it means. It means that I'm listening for how can I further the cause here. He says, this is right. Kids, you carry on a legacy. 
You carry on the legacy of faith in your family. You're not, parents, we are not raising our kids to send them out on their own. We're raising our kids so that they also go out and carry on a heritage of faith. The other may be the American dream, but Christ calls us to raise a heritage of faith. We push that out. Now, parents, I'll tell you what Spurgeon said here. Train up a child in the way he should go, but be sure to you go in that way yourself. <laughs> and here's the thing about this, guys. We're not going to be perfect parents. We're not going to be. But the cool part is, is when we're committing to Christ, we're fulfilling our roles here, a very awesome thing begins to happen. God takes up the slack in our kids. I'll tell you guys, my prayer for my kids every day of my life, sometimes three o'clock in the morning and whatever else, is that God calls and leads and reveals himself to them as he has to me. And he uses everything that I do to show that to them. Do I always do it perfectly? Yes. No. No. <laughs> but it doesn't stop me from praying for them because I trust my God more than I trust me. Embrace that, church. Remember, he's got a purpose. He works through unity. Remember, we talked about that last week. He'll work through the unity of your family. In what way? Building your family. Yes, we're going to be a family who's gospel-centered. We're going to be a family that embraces the roles. But third, and this is a big one, a family on purpose sees itself on a greater mission. A family on purpose sees itself on a greater mission. Imagine your family here, okay? We're, we're, we're showing Jesus in the way we behave toward each other. We're embracing Jesus the way we behave toward each other. You know what's going to happen? That will get the world's attention. Purpose and roles are not just to build your family. It is to equip your family to serve together in the kingdom of God. To serve together. I mean, 1 Peter 4.10 says each, is a, each of us has received a gift from God, so use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. In other words, we in stewards. You know, as we do this, the world takes Notice, family, do you serve God together? Are you serving God together in your grace and your role? Is that part of your mission? What if your family did? What if your family surrendered as a unit to say, we are going to make an impact for Jesus? And I'm not talking about moving to Zimbabwe. I'm talking about in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your schools. Do you pray for those coworkers alongside your kids? Are you praying for the students in their schools alongside the parents? You know, are, are we doing this together? What about the public square? Just as we're seen in public, man. That one I will leave without comment, just because I'm running out of time. <laughs> How about the church? How about the church? How do we come together and serve as families? That's why we have a family Sunday every month, because we don't like to just throw the kids somewhere else. We like that we worship together. We like that we get to sow into each other and they can build upon a heritage of faith as well. But that's why we do this. Family, see yourself on that greater mission because others will not help but notice you and want to be you. Your unique relationship will show others what Jesus is as you think of your family as God's social media, showing the whole world his identity. You know? Now, I get it. Look, guys, we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. Your family may not be perfect, um, we have our shortcomings, we have our struggles, we have all this stuff, but what if the healing that's happening in your family could be seen? What if the struggles began to give way to something bigger and people who knew about your struggles began to notice that too? Remember, our gospel that we preach is about redemption. It's about broken becoming whole. We can do that as well. People, I don't think they're looking for something perfect. They're just looking for something that gives them hope that their situation can be better. Your family can make that difference. How do we start? How do we start? Real quick, you start with a chat. Start with a chat. Start with a chat with God. Start with a chat with God. About what? Surrender to him. Surrender your family to him. Surrender your purposes to him. Surrender your pursuits to him. Surrender. And then begin to sow that into your family. Hey, what mission are we on for God? How can we build this thing up together? Talk about how we serve Talk about how we serve. Secondly, you start with a chat with God, but second, have a chat with each other. Around the dinner table, clean all the stuff off the table and have dinner there one night. And start chatting about what do you do? What do we do with each other? What do we enjoy doing? 
hobbies, yeah, but I'm talking about what do you enjoy doing when it comes to your spiritual life? Man, I enjoy reading my Bible. I enjoy, I enjoy greeting people at the door at church, man, that's fine you know what I think I could do? I think I could help out with this area. I think I could do this. You see what I'm saying? Chat with the family how we do this together. What are their interests and gifts? What sacrifices are we as a family willing to make to commit more to the purpose of God? That may mean less movie nights and more commitment to Jesus' word. It may mean less activities so that we can commit to serving in the church. It may mean some of those things, but think the impact I mean, guys, dream a little in your family. What would it look like if your family shared a passion for Jesus? What would it look like if your family got together and understood that we could rally around the church like we rally around sports, like we rally around movies, like we rally around our hobbies? What if we rallied around the kingdom that way? What if that became something, man? What would change in your family if the focus shifted? Because I want you to understand There's nothing stopping you but you. Don't let it stop you. Because I'll wrap it with this. God can and will use your family in a broken whatever it is you've got in your family. to He'll take that and he will use it to change the world. So be a family on purpose. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to just come together and and understand what it means to be family a little bit. Because God, so often we lose our mark on that and we lose our way with all of our activities and everything else just going on. The fights, the hurts that we don't know if we can ever get over. But God, when we embrace your purpose, when we begin to center ourselves around the gospel and embrace the roles you've given to us because of you, and we sense our greater role in the mission. Father, I know, I've experienced, I've seen how you heal families because of these things. Because we unlock your power in us. And Jesus, I ask you today, begin calling the families of grace. Begin inspiring and challenging us to move forward in you. Let us call out to you, Jesus, on behalf of our own family and on behalf of all the families in our church, that we would be on purpose for you and experience the power of your healing and see the impact you can make through us. Because Jesus, we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.